This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. speaker is Dr. Suzanne Fenton, who earned her master's and doctorate degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the endocrinology and reproductive physiology program, working in the areas of artifi artificial insem insemination and mammary gland biology. Her postdoctoral studies were at UNC in Chapel Hill and focused on the roles and gene regulation of epidermal growth factor receptor ligands in the mammary gland. Dr. Fenton was a research biologist at US EPA's Reproductive Toxicology Division from 1998 to 2009. In October of 2009, she joined the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences. Dr. Fenton recently served on the working group of the Breast Cancer and Environment Research Centers and she represents the National Toxicology Program at the congressionally mandated Interagency Breast Cancer and Environment Research Coordinating Committee. She's the recipient of many awards at NIEHS, um, and this year was awarded NIEHS Paper of the Year, uh, Dr. Fenton. All right, so Linda introduced you to the many of the concepts that I'm going to talk about, so I'm going to talk about some of the introductory material quickly. As I'm the first speaker in this session, and because we're covering an important um, critical period in the life stage of in utero exposure, um, I wanted to introduce the entire uh, session, so we're going to start with that. Um, Linda alluded to the Barker hypothesis. This was um, an idea formulated a couple of decades ago. Um, sometimes it's called thrifty phenotype or fetal programming hypothesis. Really what it means is that the maternal environment, which when this idea was developed meant um, undernutrition, um, maternal stress, um, famine is exactly how it started, um, can lead to a variety of conditions in later life, but they all start in the womb and it depends on what mom's exposed to. So this just illustrates the idea that during critical periods in early fetal development, there are, can be persistent changes in the body's structure and function caused by environmental stimuli in the offspring. We now call this developmental origins of adult disease, DOHAD, um, fetal basis of adult disease, FEBAD. There's a couple of different um, names for it, but it means the same thing. It means that environment and lifestyle participate with um, heritable factors during the time of pregnancy to cause um, potentially lifelong um, influences on the health and um, viability of the offspring. Some of the sensitive life stages um, are also called many names. Uh, so I want to talk about a little bit about that because you're going to hear these terms throughout the day today. They can be called critical periods, critical windows, susceptible subpopulations, life stage susceptibility, windows of vulnerability, sensitive life stages. There are many names. What they mean is there are sensitive critical periods of time and development when environmental influences may have a more powerful or sensitive um, effect on the uh, tissues or the um, developing organism. What makes them more sensitive is many things. So the developing child has an immature gut system. It doesn't absorb things like you do as an adult. It has an in, it has a um, underdeveloped immune system. The neurological system is not fully developed at birth. The reproductive system certainly isn't developed until after puberty. 
Um, many of the enzymatic processing systems that we as adults have, um, infants do not have, so their absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of a chemical insult can't be handled the same way we would handle it. Um, also, the rapidly dividing cells in many of the tissues in the body um, cause these windows of susceptibility. They are targets for um, defects in DNA replication, um, and the blood-brain barrier also is not fully formed at birth. So things that would not normally be able to get to the brain can get to the brain in, a, in an underdeveloped um, child. And last but not least on this list, and there's many more things that you could mention here, is the fact that the blood volume is lower in a child. Um, so if, if a child is exposed to the same exposure we as an adult are exposed to, they may have a higher body burden because of the lower um, blood volume that it can circulate in. So this whole concept of fetal basis of adult disease has been recognized in the breast development and disease field. And there's, there are many reasons for that. Um, myself and many people in this room have contributed to the knowledge base that has formed this, this description here. So during gestation, we know that the mammary gland begins to form. The mammary bud forms, and there's an initial branching that takes place in the gland. In early life, after birth, there's a development of the epithelium. It continues to grow into this fat pad that's formed under the layer of the skin. Terminal end buds, which are critical structures in the gland that are very sensitive to insult, chemical insult, are formed during this time, and they divide very rapidly. And that begins just prior to puberty, but then during puberty, you have an exponential growth of the gland that takes place. During this time, um, the terminal end buds differentiate, which is a really important process in puberty. Um, the length of time that terminal end buds are present um, will make a difference in the, in the susceptibility to breast cancer over a person's lifetime. Pregnancy and lactation, again, is another time of rapid development of the gland. And it's also undergoing maturation at that time. So you're shifting from a process of rapid growth to a time of differentiation and important function. If the growth didn't take place properly, then the differentiation and secretion of milk may not take place either, as Linda alluded to, that many women can't lactate who want to. And then again, during adulthood, there's a senescence that takes place, a, a reduction in the lobular um, portions of the gland that become very immature and um, respond differently to hormones than they did prior to that time. So all of this taken together shows you that there are some really important times and critical periods in mammary gland development that um, we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm going to skip this because you, you all know now that one in eight women are affected by breast cancer, but the important part is at the bottom of this picture. Environment and lifestyle are really the major portions of um, what, we're exp what we have in our life that may be modifying breast cancer risk. And I want to specifically talk about endocrine disruptors. So what are endocrine disrupting compounds? They are exogenous agents, meaning they're something from outside of your body that interfere with the production, the release, the transport, metabolism, binding, action, or elimination of a natural hormonal process in your body that's needed for normal development or homeostasis. So that means it doesn't have to just inhibit a, a receptor from binding to its natural ligand. There are many ways that chemicals can be um, endocrine disruptors. And specifically for the breast, this is important because there's not one or two hormones that affect the breast. There are many, and they're shown here on this picture. So all of these are um, endocrine pathways that are important for bre normal breast development and function and must be considered in um, looking at endocrine disruptors that affect breast cancer risk. So at the bottom of this slide, you can see there are like 85,000 plus chemicals on the open market today. Did anybody know that? A lot of people know that, right? Well, so did you also know that there's only about 20 on this list that we know of that have been evaluated for uh, effects on breast cancer risk and that we know something about. Um, the National Toxicology Program tests many chemicals for carcinogen action, and we've recently implemented some new methodology that will allow us to look at susceptibility um, and not just carcinogenic action, so something that might make a, the breast more susceptible to cancer over a lifetime. 
So some of these chemicals have been shown to increase carcinogenesis in rodent models. And also, some of them have been evaluated with other reproductive outcomes. So within a study, um, multiple reproductive outcomes may have been evaluated, like the uterine and ovarian response in addition to the mammary response and puberty. Um, in those studies, the ones that have the asterisks, the mammary gland has actually been shown to be the most sensitive tissue in those studies. So for example, genistein, in a multi-generational study taken, that took place with the ATSDR and the NTP, we found that um, genistein was actually causing mammary gland changes in male rats at the lowest level um, of any of the tissue responses that they detected. So it was, it was a sensitive outcome. And Linda forgot to talk about dioxin in her last talk, but I got it here, so I got you covered. <laughs> <laughs> Dioxin's a really important endocrine disruptor. Um, it is also a carcinogen. As you can see at the bottom, it is classified as a carcinogen by almost everyone who classifies carcinogens. We know it's a bad actor. But when it comes to the breast, it, it is also um, endocrine disruptor. So if you don't know a lot about dioxins, they're pollutants. They're not something that's made generally. It's caused by um, combustion of plastics and such, and, and it is a pollutant in the air, and we all have it in our bodies. But dioxins are um, a, a family of compounds um, that include dibenzofurans, biphenyls, naphthalenes. They're brominated or chlorinated, and they can be mixed. Um, they bind to the aerial hydrocarbon receptor and they have a long half-life and they bioaccumulate in fat. Um, there is a common spectrum of responses that we're not really gonna talk about today, um, but because I, I wanna talk specifically about the effect on mammary tissue. Our lab, uh, together with Linda's um, lab, have, have evaluated um, critical windows of exposure for dioxin that affect the mammary gland development. We know that exposure during the time of breast bud development, so if we gave um, a single exposure of dioxin to animals on day 15 of pregnancy, of a 21-day pregnancy in a rat. So about six or seven days before birth, they had one exposure. During the time of breast bud development, we saw on postnatal day four, which is shown on the left, and postnatal day 25, which is about the time of weaning um, on the right, that compared to controls, the animals that were exposed on gestation day 15 had more significant of effect of a delay in development than did any of the other time points when we gave dioxin. So we gave dioxin on gestation day 20, postnatal day one, um, five, 10, et cetera. But only those on the time, at the time of breast bud development were critical for the delayed developmental effect that persisted over the animal's lifetime. <clears throat> in addition to that, dioxin also affects lactation. So in this study, in mice, so the last study was in rats, and now we have mice, and we gave animals um, dioxin on postnatal day one or, and seven of their um, pregnancy, and then evaluated the mom's lactational you know, development, the mammary gland development, over the period of pregnancy. Um, and I, as you can see on the left-hand side of the vehicle, the right-hand side is dioxin treated. As early as two days later, after the second exposure, we could already see that we weren't developing lobules in, that, in this system. And by day 17, you can really see a dramatic difference in the density of lobulovular tissue that was developed in that gland. And this le actually led to abnormalities in mammary gland that were so severe that the animals, the offspring died in this study. But the important point here is, in the animals that weren't pregnant, we also gave them dioxin at the same time points. And as you can see on the far right side, there's a comparison there of vehicle and TCD treated animals that were not pregnant. They are adults. There was no difference. We could see no difference in the mammary gland development between those two groups of animals. So if exposed as an adult, not undergoing a critical period of development, no change whatsoever. Critical period of development, we see changes in not only the mom, but we also see changes in the offspring and in the second generation after that. And the important point here is that this isn't just happening in rodents. We're seeing these sort of changes in humans also. So in the, in the top part, you can see that the development of the mammary gland is also um, been detected um, as related to dioxin exposure in girls. So both in the Netherlands, um, which is the Lee's publication, and um, Den Haan um, covered the Cerveso 
um, cohort of people that were exposed during a occupation, uh, not occupation, uh, explosion event. Um, there were girls that were at the highest levels of dioxin exposure had stunted mammary gland development. So one of these was in an area that was accidentally polluted. One of these is in an area that's where the natural pollution level um, is no different than here probably. And they, the people with the highest levels of dioxin had the most stunted breast development. In breast cancer risk, um, there are several examples. The German um, occupational workers um, are more apt to have breast cancer develop in females. And a very recent update on this showed a 23-year mortality follow-up of 400 women occupationally exposed in a pesticide plant that contains dioxin um, have a, a very high level of uh, breast cancer mortality, twice that of their unexposed cohorts. Um, in other areas of Russia and Italy, there is an increase, at least a two-fold increase, in breast cancer risk in women with the highest dioxin exposures. Um, lactation is also impaired in PCB um, dioxin exposed women. So this is probably the best example that we have of translational um, interpretation of the data across animals and humans. It really suggests that dioxin probably affects the breast in a uh, adverse way over their lifetime. PFOA, or perfluoroactanoic acid, um, is a compound that is studied both in my lab and within this BSERP program by Sandy Haslam and her colleagues. Um, it's one of many perfluoroalkyl acids. These are used as surfactants um, since the 1950s, produced by 3M, DuPont, uh, Dow, BASF. Several companies produce these compounds. Um, they're used at, in the production of fluorotelomers, like in um, Teflon-coated pans, Gore-Tex um, products, scotch guarding, um, anything that's greaseproof or waterproof has this kind of coating on it. It's also used as a friction reducer in electrical um, wiring. It's a final, C8 or PFOA is a final breakdown product, and it's very stable in our bodies. Every single person in this room has it in their body, and it's not readily metabolized. Um, the C8 science panel is a group of people who are being um, paid to investigate the health effects of these compounds by DuPont in, from a court, uh, court battle. They have found probable links to several health um, outcomes in the uh, group of people in Ohio and West Virginia who were accidentally exposed to this compound. And you can see those here. Um, they just released their most recent one that looked at high cholesterol levels causes hypertension in pregnant women and um, thyroid disease. But one of the things that it does also is it um, causes delays in mammary gland development when given during gestation. So here is the work of Sally White, and this is a little bit complicated, so I'm going to walk you through it a little bit. If you look at the top row, it's the control animals. That's what the mammary gland should look like at weaning, in just after um, puberty, and in early adulthood. So those are the three time points I'm showing you. If you look at the very bottom row, that's five milligrams per kilogram of oral exposure to these animals during gestation only. So during pregnancy, the mom was exposed orally to this compound. Um, we gave it to them. Um, you can see the difference in mammary gland development if you look at the top row and the bottom row is substantial. So that in this strain of mouse, we see significant permanent delays in mammary gland development. If you look at the middle row, that's one milligram per kilogram of PFOA. A lot less uh, um, drastic of an effect, but it's also permanent over the lifetime of those animals. What we did is we gave them, if you look at the second row, we gave them five parts per billion, which is just higher than what the people in West Virginia and Ohio had in their water supply. We also affected their mammary gland development in those animals by giving that to them in their water. Um, in another experiment, we looked at um, mammary gland development at very low levels. So we're giving them now less than one milligram per kilogram uh, PFOA, but we're giving it to them during a critical window. We're just going from gestation day 10 to gestation day 17 in the mouse, which is a day before pregnancy in the mouse. And so um, if you look at the first row on the table and the developmental scoring, um, we actually look at several endpoints in the development of the gland, and we score the severity of effect, just like a pathologist would do in um, scoring pathology in the, in the clinical lab. 
So we found significant effects of PFOA based on all the developmental patterns that we saw. We could also quantitate several of the endpoints, and you can see here anything with an asterisk on it was significantly inhibited by PFOA. But so at 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram, which correlates to some very important numbers. So if you can look in the red boxes, at 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram, by the time we've weaned these animals, their body burdens, what they have inside them, is similar to what the children, or actually lower, than what children in the Ohio River Valley um, had in their blood. So you can see that we are very relevant here in terms of what people are exposed to. And even in some of our higher dose groups, um, by the time that early adulthood came around, the levels in the bodies of those animals were similar to what the children are exposed to in these areas. Now, I want to come full circle because this isn't just about the mammary gland. Like Linda said earlier, there's a lot of things that are affected. There are risk factors for breast cancer that are also affected by this, this compound. So as you can see on the left-hand side, those animals were from our studies. The one on the left, the fat one, is the one that had PFOA while it was in utero. The one on the right is the one that was a control animal. The, um, in terms of uterine growth, we can also see over a very short treatment period that the um, uterine um, growth is altered in these animals. We see advanced breast disease as the animals age. So in the breast disease section there, those are 18-month-old animals. And you can see that the stromal um, section of that mammary gland has actually formed a stromal, stromal hyperplasia at this point, very out of control um, development. And we have this effect on lactation. So it, it doesn't just affect these. It affects many other things, such as um, pubertal timing, um, liver disease, latex cell tumors in males, in rats. Um, and metabolic endpoints such as insulin and leptin concentrations. So one of the important parts of this is that when we gave this compound to adult animals, we saw none of these changes. This is a developmental uh, effect. So in, in adults, we don't see these changes, and that is really important. So it brings, kind of, brings home the um, overall effects of um, these critical life stages, how important they are, and you're going to hear a lot of more exciting um, things about that today. And thank you for your attention. This is our PFOA team.